We have an election coming up in two days. Anybody, I didn't know if anybody knew that or not. I, 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 if you have watched the news media uh, for five seconds, you saw a few political ads. And whether you're Republican or whether you're Democrat or whether you're independent, uh, I, let, me just, let me just make a survey. Um, how many of you are actually excited about the election? Raise your hand. Huh? There's like three people. But how many of you are intrigued of what's taking place within the election? I'm intrigued with it. Uh, I, I, I bring it up. I, I, I'm, I watch two channels. I watch CNN and Fox News. I want to, because I, I, if I believe half of CNN and half of Fox I probably get a dis decent perspective of what's really taking place. But if I just watch Fox, uh, I don't get half of it. But if I watch CNN, the whole world's falling apart. So I try to watch that in the middle. Um, how many of you can't wait till Tuesday night is over with? Amen. You know, it is an issue of our life. And I really need to talk about a couple issues. Um, I want to challenge you before Tuesday to do one thing. To put your faith ahead of your politics. In other words, your faith filter up front. Your political filter somewhere down the line. To be a Christ follower first, a Republican second. A Christ follower first, a Democrat second. Or a Libertarian second. Or an Independent second. Because bottom line, when you die, you do not go to Washington, D.C. <laughs> you don't. When you die, you have the privilege of going to heaven. So our hearts and our minds need to be fixed on the things that are important to us. We are the light of the world. Our job is to transform people's lives. Our job is to change people's lives. And challenging you to put your faith before your politics on Tuesday, we have to understand what that means. That means things take place instantaneously that changes everything that you think and everything that you do. I want to challenge you to put people above politics. And if everybody puts people above politics people is what matters Amen. people that are hurting is what matters Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump is not in charge of our country you know who's in charge of our country almighty God and if we get such a narrow perspective that we're gonna give our country and give our church and give our lives to two individuals that could not give a rip about you. They give a rip about themselves. You know who gives a rip about you? Give me the answer. God. So why don't we talk to God about our lives? You know, we can have an opinion, and we all have our opinions. My, we have our opinion. My wife says, I have an opinion about everything. She goes, turn off the stupid TV. Okay? No, it's, 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 it's two days away. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a political junkie. I've got to watch it. I've got to see what's going on. But at the end of the day, it's just news. At the end of the day, God is still in control. At the end of the day, it's intriguing to me. And I like to talk about it. I bring it up. I'm a political junkie. But Tuesday, when the heat is lowered... And whoever wins, wins. God is in control. You know, the challenging part about life is that it goes on. We thought eight years ago, 14 years ago, 20 years ago, the world's going to fall apart. But you know, I believe God has a plan for us. And so sometimes we get so narrow-minded in our plan that we do not ask God to get in the middle of our plan. 
And whether we are Republican and Democrat, our political perspective makes sense to us. We believe what we believe because our situation and our life and what's gone on, and it makes sense to us. And so when we're talking to others, why do you believe that? If we are about people, what we need to do is ask people, why do you believe that? You know, because I believe that if we ask people what their scenario is, you're going to hear a story. A story that you may not be ready to hear. A story that you may be shocked in. A story that may rock your world as a Republican, as a Democrat, or as an Independent. You may ask them, why do you believe that? And it may be because you watch Fox News or you watch CNN. But to sit down with an individual and say, can I hear your story? And you sit down with a young lady or you sit down with a couple and you find out that they've done some bad choices in their life. And they've made some mistakes in their life. So they have a perspective of what they did is right. It may not be your view. But if they have made some mistakes with their life and with their child, and they hold to a view that's not biblical, but it's theirs, are we going to alienate them because they don't hold to your view? Because if we alienate them because they don't hold to your view, how are we going to ever win them to Jesus Christ? See, if political Democrats and political Republicans live our lives for the political arena instead of the spiritual arena, we're going to alienate what God has called us to do, and that's to seek and to save those which are lost. Our job as a church is to stand up for the truth our job is not to alienate somebody because they do not believe the way that we believe or even vote the way we vote. There's evidence in the Bible where Jesus called Matthew the follower. And he said this. This is where the Republicans started, right here. And he spoke a parable unto a certain which trusted them that they righteous despise others. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a publican. That's a Republican, right? It's close enough. That's as close to the Bible as I can get to a Republican. So that's where we're going to go. And the Pharisee stood and, and prayed thus to himself, God, I think that I am not like uh, these extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this publican. I fast twice a week. I give my tithes and all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much of his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. It, Republicans are in the Bible. <laughs> they are right in the Bible. But you know what? Democrats are in the Bible, too. Do you know Jesus was the ultimate Democrat? Oh, oh what do you mean? Oh, here we go. Here we go. What do you mean? <laughs> health care. Jesus dispersed health care absolutely free to everyone he met. He was the man on health care. You came up to him and you had a problem, healed. And he did not send an Obamacare <laughs> receipt for what he did. He gave out free health care. He was the man. He even gave out food. We know two times he gave out food to thousands of individuals so he had a major food bank, and he said, if you're hungry, come to me. And it had 12 baskets left over. Republicans are right wing. Democrats are left wing, and they had 12 baskets left. Oh, now, if I had to explain it that hard, come on. Come on. They had 12 baskets left over. I worked hard on that, and you guys didn't even like it. We could say put the Bible first and politics second. But you know, 
we can use the Bible, and you can use your view of the Bible, and you can have a view of what the Bible says about almost any point on your political system. And you could hold that Bible up and we can say this is why I believe this. And we could use that Bible and we can beat somebody up over the head with that Bible and say if you do not vote the way I vote, you must not be a Christian. And you know what? There are good Christians that are Democrats. There are good Christians that are Republicans. There's good Christians that are independent. And we can hold that Bible up and we can mock them and laugh at them and say if you do not vote the way I vote that you must not be a good Christian. And what we are saying to them is, I am better than you. I know more than you. Clearly that's not the case. We can, we, can, we can look at the political arena. We can look at our faith or we can look at the Bible. But here's what I want to put up. I want to put up our faith in front of our politics. And how do I, how do I work this out? I want to boil this down to we need to put people above politics. We need to put people above politics. See, people, people that you work with, people that you go to school with, and people that are in your family, they're more important than who you vote for. We can have opinions, and we do. But there's something that can take place within your life that absolutely changes everything and you could care less what happens Tuesday. If an event, a catastrophic, catastrophic event takes place and the polls open Tuesday and you can't even get to the polls because something happens within your family. But you know what we need to do? We need to put people above politics. We need to put people that are hurting Above Paul. You know what would take place if we actually did what God has called us to do and asked us to do? He said this in Matthew chapter 12. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And then he said this before he even opened up his eyes. And the second is like it. I'm not telling you just to love God because you can fake that. We've all faked that. We all, I love God. I go to church. I love that. I can love God without anybody knowing that I love God. I can, I can come to church and I can raise my hand and I can fake the loving God thing. I can do that internally. Love your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And the first commandment, but in the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. He's just saying this, love God, but demonstrate it by loving others. You know, we would not care who the president is, who the county commissioner is, who the city council is, if city of Wichita would love others. If we had the mandate within our hearts to love God and love others, we wouldn't need laws and rules Jesus said it in Matthew, love God and love others. There's no other greater commandments. You can keep law, but we can demonstrate our love to God by our actions to others. Now, we can say we love God, but if we do not have action towards others, blah, 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 blah. Everybody has a mouth, everybody talks, but nobody does. But when the rubber hits the road, when problems take place, if you love God, it will come out in loving others. But if we do not love others, if we do not serve others, if we do not care about others, it is lip service to God at the best. We need to love others. It is our mandate to love others. If we have a mandate that I love God or I come to church or I can do my thing on Sunday but we don't put it into action, listen to this verse found in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. It says, Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart 
from a good conscience and from a sincere faith. Huh. Love from a pure heart. I, I love you without getting anything from you. I love you because I love God and I just want to be a vessel to, to love others. From a good conscience, that means I'm not, I'm not doing anything other than being who God wants me to be. I, I love you. I, when I get done at the end of the day, I can lay my head down at night and I can go to sleep because I love you out of a pure conscience and a sincere faith. A sincere faith. My faith in God is more important than the politics that I hold. My faith in God and my position in God is the priority within my life. Jesus was right. Everything hinges on love of God on the inside and how we treat our neighbors on the outside. If I were to say, why would you vote for him? Why would you support that? Why would you march against that? Why would you be lined up in his way? Why would you send everybody that article? Why would you say that on Facebook? What position are you holding and you're presenting so everybody could hold out? Why are you doing that? When we don't know what we are presenting, when we are offending instead of loving, are we doing that from a pure heart? See, I believe that you should have opinions. We all have opinions. Everyone, has, I have more opinions about everything than anybody in this room. I have a stinking lot of opinions. But my opinions don't really matter. You know what matters more than my opinion? My vote. I believe every one of us should vote. I believe we should vote our opinion. But here's the thing. You know, I took a test uh, about a month ago. We were uh, playing golf down in, in Texas, and, and uh, one of my buddies had this app. And he said, he said, hey, let's take this and find out who we support more. And I, I found this app, and I want to put it up on the screen. It says, I side with .com. Is it up there? I side with .com. Now, if you want to write that down, if pull that app up, I side with .com, there's a hundred questions in that about all of the political issues of the day. I didn't even know some of these political issues of the day. And you know what? I say I am for something, and I didn't even know what something was. Okay, let me give you an illustration. Um, and I know this sounds bad. I did not know what fracking was. Okay, anybody know what fracking is? I didn't know. So I said, are you for fracking or against fracking? Uh, let me Google what fracking is. Okay, so I am voting on something that I don't know anything about until I read it. Yeah, I'm for any energy issue. Yeah, I'm, I'm for that. But I didn't know what it was. So I think it's smart if we are going to vote to know what we're voting on. How important is that? Not to go to the polls because CNN said to go to the poll or to Fox go to the poll. You know what? We're marginalized the best. You know, if CNN says this and Fox News says this, let's go to the middle and believe half of what they both say. Somebody give me an amen. amen. We agree with that. We agree with that. Jesus' followers should be more confident, more curious, more composed, and more compassionate than anybody else in the room. Why is that? Jesus' followers should be more confident. Confidence. We know that Tuesday is a day. But Wednesday, God is still in control. We understand that a man cannot control God. That God is in control of man. We do not have to fear what tomorrow has in store for us because we have God and we are God's children and we are bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. I can be confident in knowing that I don't have to worry about the sky falling. I don't have to worry about what he or she would ever do to me because I know that Jesus loves me. I know that. That's confident. And I like this. We should be curious. What, what, what do you mean be curious? I think, I think we should be learners. I think, I think we have the ultimate illustration of God that has ultimate wisdom, that knows everything, the creator of the world, 
When somebody says something that we don't know, oh, really? Let me look into that. Let's talk about that. We don't have to debate something that we do not know. We can learn what we do not know. We should be curious to understand what God wants. And then here's the big one. I believe we should be composed. You see, we have a mandate. And there's nothing worse than the week before election to find out who's composed and who is not. I, I wish I would do this. Uh, I, I, I can't because I'm addicted, but I, I wish I could do this. I wish I could turn off Facebook a week before the election. Because sometimes Christians are not very composed. Sometimes we say things that really may be true. But the animosity and the anger that is said behind it is really not very godly. But I believe that as a child of God, when we know who we are, we can be composed. We, we were doing this leadership thing here on Wednesday nights. And one of the things on leadership is, is when everybody else is going off, a leader stays calm. When we can compose ourselves and we know that Jesus is in control. We know that I'm a child of God. I'm not, I'm not the one making the decisions. I can be composed because of who Jesus is. Not because of my position. My position is nothing. I'm a one person. But I can vote my position. But I do not have to hurt somebody through my position. Jesus followers should be confident, curious, composed. And the last one. Is compassionate. If Christ followers are not compassionate, what we're doing is we're losing our influence within them to love them and to point them to Jesus Christ. So, two days before the election, I'm sure that at the water coolers, at work, at school, questions are going to be come up about who you're going to vote for. Are you going to vote for her or are you going to vote for him? I want to give you four questions to ask. What led you to that view? Why? What led you to that view? Or what led you to believe that? Or what led you to this position? See, unless we become a student and love them and care for them, not debate them and fight them, we'll never be able to win them. Second one, have you always held that view? Have you always seen it that way? Have you always voted that way? Have you always supported that idea? Have you always ever went from the other side? So when you have those two questions and the conversation starts to get away outside of the policies and this starts becoming very volatile, and it starts turning personal as, you know, the Bible does say Christians shouldn't gossip, right? And it says, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. And just because the political arena is very anti-biblical and they're talking very bad things to each other, it doesn't give us the right to say, well, I'm going to take that part out of the Bible. I, I, I can say whatever I want to say about whoever I want to say. But as a Christian, we have to hold that mandate. Let no unwholesome talk come out of our mouth. Or let no gossip come out of our mouth. I would just like to ask you this question. Do you know him? Do you know her? You, you, you've met her. You, you've sat down and talked to her. Because the answer would be no. Then I say, so, you like me, we get most of our information from media, from the news, and clearly everything that we hear on the news is true. <laughs> so you're letting the media dictate what you believe, and you're allowing the media to determine how you vote, and ultimately you're allowing the media to determine our friendship. So, I want to give you four things in conclusion. Should you have an opinion? 
Absolutely yes. We should be informed and we should have an opinion. Should you argue your point? Yeah. With love and respect, you should argue your point. Should you make your point at the expense of your influence towards others? No. See, leadership is influence. We have a bigger mandate than to vote on Tuesday. Our bigger mandate was given to us 2,000 years ago, and that's to reach this world for Jesus Christ. Our mandate is not to vote Tuesday. Our mandate is to reach people for Jesus Christ. If you're not reaching people for Jesus Christ, Tuesday's mandate to vote about people, we need to have what we have at our disposal, and we need to take advantage of it. We should vote our conscience, but we should not lose our reputation and our influence towards others because of your opinion. Should you ever jeopardize a relationship because of your position? No. We, sometimes what we do is we forget as Christians, God is in control. We have a job to do, and that job is to reach this world for the cause of Jesus Christ. Period. Jesus came to seek and to save those which were lost. Healthy people, they don't need the physician. Sick people, they need the physician. The church is the hospital for the sick. If we are not the hospital for the sick, we're not doing our job. And believe me, you're pretty sick. We have a lot of sickos around here. Praise Jesus. If we didn't have sickos, we would not be doing our job. We need to have people that are hurting, that are struggling in their marriages, that are seeking after God, that care more about what God wants than anything else. They're struggling, they're hurting, they're destitute. And where do they go? They go to you. They go to the church. You wrap your arms around them and you love them and you help them because you are the answer. Not another government policy. Not another entitlement. It's the church. It's you. Your love. Your help. So down the road, maybe two weeks, three weeks, the heat of the election is over with. And you got mad at a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent. And you told them off because you did not agree with their position. And their life falls apart. And you have lost your influence. You have lost the right to speak to them because they think the politics are more important than the relationship. What we need to do, we need to remember as a child of God, as a church, politics, oh, we, we do it, we watch it. But I am never going to leave a relationship because of a position I'm going to always fail on the side of people, never against people. So five weeks down the road, after that election is over with, and everything's calmed down, and everybody's back to normal, and nothing has changed, and it's another president, and we're going back the same way we've always had it, and we'll talk about him or her for the next four years, and pray that somebody else gets in there in the next four years. But when calamity takes place, they're not going to call the president. They're not going to call the government. When some crazy takes place, they're going to call you. They're going to ask you to pray for them. They're going to ask you to love them. They're going to ask you to help them. Not the government, not the president, but the church. Vote your 
faith. But don't lose your relationships and your influence because of your position. We all have different positions. But as I have witnessed this week, stuff could happen in a heartbeat that really the election is very important. But there's bigger things than the election. And you know what the bigger thing is? People. Hurting people. Struggling people. And when you die, the press is not going to go to your funeral. You can stand up and you can proclaim his message. But you can lose your influence to everyone around you. Have your opinion. We all do. But don't lose relationships because of it. Be composed about how you feel. You don't have to write everything on Facebook just because you're mad. You can sometimes be mature and be composed and think about it before you write about it. And most of the times when you think about it before you write about it, you probably wouldn't write it. Make it look like that your mama's going to read what you're writing. And then I'll maybe change everything that you're going to say too. Be composed. Love people. Love God. There's an old song. Because Republican and Democrat, left or right, are all precious in his sight. Because Jesus loves all the little children of the world. Jesus loves the Republicans. Jesus loves the Democrats. Jesus loves the independents. Because Jesus loves you. And if Jesus loves people, that's our mandate. To serve and love people. Tuesday. You're going to come? It's going to go. They're going to be thousands of people to go through our gym to vote. They're going to vote on Tuesday night around 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock. Hopefully we'll have a new president, new city council, new county commissioners. We're going to wake up Wednesday morning and guess what? We're going to go to school. We're going to go to work. We still have relationships that we're going to go to. Let's not lose what we have built because of our opinions. Let's cast our vote. Let's do what God wants us to do. But let's always remember, voting is important. But we're in the job of people. Looking at somebody's life. Look at their hearts. See, if we could say this one thing. We need to be a learner and not a critic. If somebody does something or has a different opinion than you, one of the questions is, why? Can we, can we talk about it? Not just because CNN says it or not because Fox News says it, but what is your story? And you're going to find out when you are a learner instead of a critic that you may not agree to their position, but you're going to understand why they have that position. And if we are truly the children of God, even if their position is not my position, I can still love them because who they are. But if their position is different than mine and I alienate them because I don't like their position, that's childish. That's immature. I need to be able to wrap my arms up and be man enough or woman enough to love them even though they disagree with me because they are still people and people are the priority. The church exists not for politics. The church exists for you. For people. Let us never forget we are here to reach people of all kinds, of all 
persuasions, all political views. We're not here to be Democrat. We're not here to be Republican. We're not here to be independent. We're here to be Christ followers. And the head of the church is Jesus. The head of the church is Christ. Everything that we do, everything that we say, everything that we ever think about should be what would Christ want me to do? And Christ said this, my number one mandate is to seek and to save those which are lost. And if they are lost, they're not going to be like you. They're not going to have your opinions. They're not going to think like you, vote like you, or even act like you. But Jesus came to seek them to the body of Christ. So I love our diversity. I love that our church is unique. I love our church has problems. Not, maybe not as many problems. We, you know, we, we don't need this many problems. But I love our church has some issues. Why is that? Because our church is reaching out to a world and bringing them in to follow Christ. That is the mandate that Jesus gave you and he gave me. His mandate is not Tuesday. His mandate is in the future. His mandate is he came, he died, he rose again, and one day he's coming back for us. And we, the body of Christ, is his voice piece. It's not Hillary Clinton and it's not Donald Trump. They're not our voice piece. We're not their ambassadors. We do not speak for them. We speak for Jesus. He is the architect, the cornerstone, and the church's mandate to seek and to save those which are lost.